Hello, this is Kyle Matthews of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. We're very pleased today to have another interview as part of our Coronavirus Diaries, uh, discussions about human rights during the global pandemic. Today, we're very fortunate to uh, uh, talk to Jeffrey York, the uh, Africa correspondent for the Globe and Mail. Uh, he joins us from Johannesburg. Jeffrey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Jeffrey, I'd like to maybe talk a bit. <clears throat> One thing we've noticed is that there's been a lot of focus on Europe and on Asia about this pandemic and not as much talk about Africa really at this stage. So you're in, <clears throat> you're in Johannesburg, South Africa. Tell us about what's happening in South Africa generally re regarding the, uh, the coronavirus and, and the response to try to stop the pandemic. Well, it's true that the virus uh, uh, took longer to arrive in Africa than uh, in, uh, in some other parts of the world, certainly longer than it took to arrive in North America or Europe or Asia, of course. Um, but we began seeing imported cases um, from travelers, basically. Um, and South Africa was one of the first places to get those imported cases. There's a lot of South Africans who go to Europe for, for um, ski holidays and things like that or, or for work and as they started to come back in uh, February and March we began to see um, uh, the first cases. I think the first case in South Africa was March 5th um, and it increased quite sharply for a while and um, although it has never reached of course the level of uh, many other countries, uh, South Africa was quite alarmed and, and all African countries are quite alarmed because, of course, their health systems are more vulnerable uh, and weaker than um, than Western or European, North American health systems. Shortages of there's not enough beds, certainly not enough ICU beds, not enough ventilators, not enough doctors and nurses, and so on. So there was a real vulnerability, and as a result of that, and knowing what other countries have gone through, um, many African countries have moved quite fast. And South Africa was one of them. They moved quite fast. They began a full lockdown on March 27th. Uh, it was for three weeks initially. It's been extended for two more weeks. Um, it could be extended again, or it could be uh, partially loosened. Um, the, the, it does seem that South Africa moved uh, quite fast and quite smartly. Uh, they did manage to flatten the curve. Uh, which is quite remarkable given that it's a vulnerable country. Um, and, you know, of course, nobody is saying that, uh, that it will not eventually have an exponential growth in South Africa. Every country in the world is vulnerable to, to the coronavirus. No country is immune. Um, nobody, the top scientists here are, are not saying that South Africa can avoid this pandemic. There's no way it can avoid the pandemic. What they're trying to do, and this is the same strategy in many countries, but it's actually been more successful here because it was started earlier. What they're trying to do is to flatten the curve so that the health system is not overwhelmed. And actually they've managed to do that so far. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, the Going back to before the lockdown in the early days, the number of cases per day was increasing by 20 or 30 or even 40 percent per day. Since the restrictions came in, starting with travel restrictions, then full travel bans, then uh, school closures, uh, and then the full national lockdown, the number of cases per day has been going up much more slowly, uh, as little as four or five percent on some days, six percent, uh, but generally under 10%, which is a pretty good number. And it means that the healthcare system has not been overwhelmed at all so far. And the scientists are saying that the peak, instead of happening now or in, uh, in May or June, when, when, when the system wasn't prepared for it, they're saying now the, the peak might be in September, which means that South Africa has bought some time. They've bought several months of preparation time, which is crucial to get all the equipment and, and uh, healthcare capacity that they need to be ready for the peak. So Jeffrey, is, there, is this happening across the entire country? I mean, the, the COVID infection rates, or are we seeing one particular region or city where it's, 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 it's more troublesome than others? Well, it, as I said, it began with the imported cases and they were just in a few areas and they were certainly uh, in, dominated by the middle class areas, more affluent, uh, places where travelers were coming back from Europe, basically, or, or some, in some cases from North America. 
Um, not very many from China, surprisingly. The, the initial concern was that it could be travelers from China that could be the source, but it was actually travelers from Europe who were the main source. So initially it was in the uh, more affluent areas, uh, middle class areas and so on, but now it is basically in all the major populated areas, and we are seeing it in the high density, low income uh, places, lo lo locations, townships and so on. It is happening there too. So uh, this is why the concern is that, you know, it, it could spread more rapidly uh, once there begins to be community transmission in the low income, high density areas where people cannot really do much social distancing. So Jeffrey, you also cover all of Africa. Uh, borders have closed. I have friends in Rwanda that said all flights have been canceled. So what's it like right now covering this pandemic, um, trying to report on the rest of Africa, being on semi-lockdown? I, I imagine um, it must be a challenge to be a journalist today. Yes, uh, you're right. And of course, the biggest problem is the travel restrictions. It's basically impossible to travel uh, well, under the lockdown, it's, it's, it's very difficult to travel even within South Africa, uh, but certainly impossible to travel outside South Africa. So that's the most obvious uh, difference. Um, you know, the other major thing that I often think about is how, you know, someone like me who's trying to keep track of what's happening in the 49 countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the past, you know, I, I never have, you know, I've never claimed to be covering Africa because nobody can cover it. I, I, I try to, you know, go in and pick and choose stories that are of interest. Um, but in the past, you know, there's always thousands of stories in, in Africa, but I could, in the past, I could pick or choose a certain story to focus on on each day or each week and, and research that one specific story. Now it's all one gigantic story. And I think every journalist worldwide is seeing this. It, all the stories have merged together in one gigantic story, which has scientific implications, health implications, political implications, security implications, and economic implications. And all of those are huge stories. And it's all merged together. So there's actually a huge increase in the workload in terms of just trying to understand what's going on. And keeping in mind that the information is constantly changing. This is a pandemic where there's actually very little solid information about the virus, how to prevent its, we know some things about how to prevent its transmission, but uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about the, the virus, how it works, um, how people are getting sick, how they're catching it. Um, there's, there's huge unknowns about how these lockdowns are going to work or, or what is the proper response for governments? How long can they sustain a lockdown? What, what are the different techniques that should be used? How do you um, compensate? How do you uh, reduce the economic pain of lockdowns? There, there are huge unknowns here, and the information is constantly shifting. So, um, and then all the science and health issues on top of that. So really, it is a massive challenge, I think, for journalists to really understand um, what is going on. And that's always our fundamental challenge, is really how do you explain what's going on in an accurate and meaningful way. Uh, and that's much more difficult now when, when the whole world is grappling with trying to understand it. So, so, Jeffrey, you, you touch upon something quite interesting. You say that there's a lot that we don't know about the virus. Um, and as such, we also have seen a lot of misinformation, conspiracy theories. I know that my colleagues and I, we've seen that in South Africa, the, the minority ATM party has been spreading some, uh, you know, some falsehoods or conspiracies. Are you hearing any, any conspiracy theories or things that are just blowing your mind and say this is not true? Or, or what's the information environment like? Well, the information environment is bad, like it is everywhere. I mean. Uh, so many people are getting their information from WhatsApp, which is an encrypted source that can't be really fact-checked uh, from outside because it's encrypted. Uh, people are very reliant on WhatsApp here. Uh, it's, it's free, it's a free app. Uh, it's, so it's affordable for people um, who may not be able to afford a lot of data on their cell phones. So a lot of information is being spread by WhatsApp and that's a major source of conspiracy theories. Um, South Africa is trying to respond by using the law, and that's controversial. You know, is that even constitutional to arrest people for spreading misinformation? Um, it's you know, that, that I'm sure there'll be legal challenges at some point, but it's an attempt to at least signal to people that if you spread misinformation and actually deliver disinformation, 
then it's dangerous to the country as a whole. It's dangerous to or the people. You are actually putting people at risk. And so to signal the seriousness of that, the government has introduced a, um, a, a law on social media that makes people potentially punishable by up to six months in jail wow. if they deliberately spread misinformation. Now, as I say, that's controversial. How do you decide what's disinformation? How do you decide... Uh, what's deliberate, what the intent was. Uh, so I can see the constitutional court challenges and so on. But in the interim, in the short term, it is sending a signal that it's dangerous to send this kind of information. One of the first people to be arrested was a guy, you know, and, and not an ignorant necessarily guy, but somebody who seems educated, but he was deliberately sending out misinformation that, um, uh, that the testing kits, the coronavirus testing kits, are dangerous and are spreading the virus. Now, the reason that that's incredibly dangerous is if people refuse to be tested because they're afraid of the testing kits, then no country can get a grip on this on this pandemic. So it really threatens the whole country. And so he's been arrested and charged, and he could face theoretically up to six months in prison. Now, um, so that's one response. But ultimately, you know, you, there are, for every person who's charged. There are thousands of others who are spreading misinformation. So um, it can't be purely that, but it's certainly a big challenge. And, uh, you know, I don't think South Africa, I don't think Africa is unique in this in any way. There's, every country in the world has, has these, you know, 5G conspiracy theories and so on, and they're incredibly dangerous. And they're a real challenge for people who are trying to spread, spread accurate information. And I, I spend some time myself trying to correct the mistakes. I, I saw a story on a major South African news agency, news website recently. Uh, it was falsely stating that uh, uh, Bill Gates was going to test a vaccine in Africa. This is a common conspiracy theory, very dangerous, uh, because it makes people hostile to vaccines. Uh, and I was able to get it corrected quite fast. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, how much can one person do or how much can the fact checkers do? There are very good fact checking services across Africa now, um, but they're limited in what they can do. Uh, and there's such a flood of disinformation that it's really difficult to control it. So, Jeffrey, there's been a lot of talk here about how the pandemic could, could wreak havoc with food supplies and that poor countries or countries with large refugee populations could face additional challenges. Are you hearing anything about, are there any countries in Africa that you're hearing anything about that, that are, that are really struggling with this right now or are extremely worried? Are you picking up anything? I mean, South Africa has a, a stronger health system than many other African countries, but are there any um, other countries that, that we should really be uh, concerned about and see if there's a way to assist them or, 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 or something like that? Yeah, um, well, there's, there's two questions. On the health system, South Africa is better off than many other African, most other African countries. Um, there are some countries that have only three or four ventilators for the whole country. So that's obviously a huge concern. Um, and there are things that are being done. I'm sure ordinary people can, can find um, agencies, relief agencies to contribute to, to help on that front. Uh, but there are medical supplies that are coming in from, from UN agencies, from the World Health Organization, from um, major relief agencies, humanitarian agencies, and from private individuals. So that's on the health front. On the food front, you're right, that's, um, it's just emerging now and it's uh, difficult to, to track it, but there are signs of food prices increasing. Uh, there are great concerns about food security, transportation of food, borders being closed. So countries that rely on imports um, are, are gonna face difficulties. Um, the, you know, the, the food supply chains, the agricultural, supply chains are being disrupted so that's a concern um you know again there are um un agencies uh you know the world food program and the uh, fao and others that are working on those issues uh and they're a good source of information on that but um it, it really it, it's a problem that is emerging so fast really that it's difficult to keep track of it we, you know anecdotally in south africa we know that um, many people, a large part of the workforce is the informal sector, people whose income is, uh, comes from daily work. Uh, 
Um, so what do you do about that? I mean, the daily work is being severely disrupted. It, you know, in response to that, South African government and some municipalities are saying informal food vendors can get permits. Uh, and But, you know, then there's massive lineups and queues and administrative hurdles to get those permits. But it's an attempt to say that the informal sector should be supported. But, of course, if people are not outside very much because of the lockdown, then their income is going to go down severely. And, of course, there's many other workers who have either been laid off or um, who, who's lost, lost their source of income. So there are things that are being done. Um, there's... Uh, the South African government is looking at a very major program that would top up the monthly social grants. Um, people don't realize this outside South Africa, but South Africa does have a quite a good system of monthly social grants to, uh, for example, um, mothers with children, uh, young children, uh, older people, and so on. So there is an existing system that covers many millions of people, and the government is looking at a system that would top that up, perhaps, you know, uh, increase it by 50% or 100% and that would really support people. That would be the fastest and quickest way to get money to the neediest people. But at the same time we are seeing food stores being uh, raided and loot looted um, and it seems that that's partly because of hunger. Um, of course there's, there's also criminality which um, you know is an ongoing problem in South Africa and I'm not going to say that everyone who loots uh, a store it's, it's because of hunger. Uh, there's always been an ongoing problem of criminality, but it does seem that uh, food shops are being um, attacked increasingly now in the past few days, and there is uh, more, more hunger than before. And that's, of course, understandable, and that's why the whole lockdown issue is so, such a dilemma for the government. And it, that's why it took such a difficult, and I have to say quite a courageous decision by uh, President Ramaphosa to announce a lockdown because he knew it would it would cause economic pain, um, and but he, he calculated and I think rightly that over the long term it would be more beneficial because it would prevent the health system from falling into total chaos. So that was the calculation he made. But now there has to be a, a decision about how do you prevent uh, or reduce the economic pain that's happening, the hunger that inevitably is happening in South Africa and even more so in other African countries. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a major human rights issue, the food security and, and uh, livelihoods of people being disrupted. It, it, it worries me and my colleagues. Jeffrey, maybe one last question. Um, let's flip away from, for, well, it's tied to Africa, but flipping away from South Africa. There, there have been reports of mistreatment of Africans in parts of China, Africans being kicked out of their homes, and it's, it's kind of erupted on, on social media of uh, some ambassadors complaining to the Chinese foreign ministry. I, I know you formerly um, worked in China for the Globe Mail. Um, what, what are you picking up from, from South Africa and Africa in general? Is, is, there, is, this just, is this something that's major and it's coming up to people's minds, the treatment of Africans abroad during the coronavirus? Or is this just um, not a big issue? What, what are you hearing? No, it, it, it's a major issue. And, um, uh, from China's point of view, they really um, shot themselves in the foot by doing this because uh, China was making huge inroads in Africa um, diplomatically in terms of soft power, in terms of influence, economic, financial, political, um, even media influence. Um, you know, China had been really increasing its, its presence and its influence in Africa, even most recently with so-called donation diplomacy, where... Um, China and Chinese government and the Jack Ma Foundation, uh, you know, uh, headed by uh, the Ali, famous Alibaba billionaire. Um, this, the, these foundations and don Chinese government were donating millions of masks, face masks and protective equipments and testing kits and so on. And they were getting a lot of kudos for that. Guangzhou, uh, the city in, in southern China, which is traditionally the home to the largest number of African um, uh, migrants or temporary visitors uh, or expatriates in, in, Af in China <clears throat> because it's a trading hub and Africans go there to trade, to export and import, um, especially to, to, to send cheap goods to, 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 to Africa. So there's, uh, I think, around 300,000 Africans in Guangzhou. And what happened is after um, 
China began to get a grip on the pandemic and began to reduce the number of new cases, uh, they began to identify foreigners increasingly as the source of new cases. So foreigners became the scapegoats or became the targets. Um, and uh, of course, it's true that cases were coming into China on airplanes. But the problem with that is the Africans in Guangzhou have not traveled for months. They, 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 they're not importing it. They, they've been there for months or years without traveling. And yet they were being targeted by the Chinese authorities. And there was, as you mentioned, all these very damaging videos on social media, restaurants that had signs saying no black people are allowed to come in. Uh, you know, that was actually McDonald's in, 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 in uh, Guangzhou. It very quickly apologized for that, but the damage was done. Um, it, because it wasn't just restaurants, it was also door-to-door um, -door, um, efforts by Chinese workers, officials, health, health workers, and so on. And they were actually evicting African migrants from hotels and apartments. And there was images of, of Africans being forced to sleep on the streets under the bridges uh, or, you know, walking through the streets with their suitcases because they had nowhere to go. And, you know, this was clearly unfair because there was no evidence that they uh, were a greater threat than anyone else. I mean, the greater, in fact, there was a statistic showing that some 90% of the imported cases in the past few weeks in China were from Chinese citizens returning from abroad. So Africans were not the problem, and yet they were being targeted and subjected to some very uh, cruel and inhumane treatment. Uh, the, the, the word inhumane was widely used by African leaders, governments, and ambassadors when they were protesting against this. And those images have been so powerful on social media that it has really damaged China's image in Africa. Now, in the long term, you know, that doesn't alter the fact that China will continue to increase its influence in Africa because meanwhile, we're seeing the US, for example, very much withdrawing from Africa, um, showing, you know, under the Trump administration, there's very little interest in Africa. There's a vacuum that China has been filling. So um, the long-term trend is the same, that China will continue to have um, increasing influence in, in, in Africa. But this has been a definite setback for China's strategy in Africa. Well, Jeffrey, I want to thank you so much for taking time from your schedule to talk to us. It was fascinating. And um, stay safe in South Africa and keep up your, your amazing reporting. Thank you very much, Kyle. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.